What's up, guys, and welcome, Daily Theologians. Today, I want to tackle the problem of evil. Where did it come from? Why did God allow it? Is it based on free will and God learning? Is it based on God desiring that we love him because of the presence of this free, autonomous ability to choose him? Spoiler alert, no. But in today's video, we're going to cover James White and two R.C. Sproul clips. This is a complicated topic, so you may have to watch this a couple times, but I think this will be really helpful if you come into this with a humble heart and a teachable attitude. Stick around and check this out. So the problem of evil is something that human beings have been wrestling with for a long time. And it goes like this. If God is good and all-powerful and evil exists, then God must not be good. Not so fast. So people try to defend this position, which is called theodicy. This is the defense of the presence of evil in the world with an all-knowing, all-powerful God. And they come up with a variety of ideas. The primary one in our culture and in the world by people that have not really studied or thought about this carefully is free will. It's the magic sauce. It's the chance that the atheist appeals to to be a powerful thing that actually isn't a force or a thing. And so the Arminian, the provisionalist, the semi-Pelagian appeals to man's autonomy to make the right choice, an island of righteousness, if you will. But of course, that does not solve the issue. So here's R.C. Sproul explaining why. And so a being who has a desire to do something evil before he chooses to do that evil is already fallen before he makes the choice. Do you see that? That's the point that so many people miss when they say, oh, well, it was all because of the free choice of Adam and Eve. But the question is, why did these creatures who were made in the image of God and who were made good choose to disobey Him? Well, if you say for no reason, that there was no prior inclination, no prior desire or disposition, then you've described a choice that is not a moral action at all. You've denied the moral agency of the creature when you say he does it arbitrarily. Some people look at the text of Genesis, chapter 3, and they will argue, well, they were coerced into sinning by the power of Satan. This is the old argument, the devil made me do it. So two problems there. Number one, you cannot have a choice or an action without the desire first. The desire comes first. So this is uh, basically an infinite regression problem. And to illustrate this, look at Mormonism with a polytheistic view of gods. There are many gods, just one in this universe. Well, who made the first god? And it, it's just moving the problem uh, of God out into another realm, and you have an infinite regression problem. In the same way, when the Arminian or Pelagian or Provisionalist appeals to free will or economy, it's just moving the discussion to where did the desire come from, okay? So don't miss that game. It's a game because the problem is why evil exists can be answered. Where it came from cannot be answered answered. There is no answer from our perspective. So don't miss this. Pay very close attention. The why evil exists is pretty straightforward, in my opinion. The where did it come from? How exactly was it created uh, in, in that sense is not something we can answer uh, 100%. No one can. And let me explain why. So so stay with this video because I think what you're going to see is the Arminian, the Pelagian, the Provisionalist, the Open Theist, uh, which are all variations of bad teaching to outright heresy, make the problem of evil meaningless. It has no it has no meaning. It's just kind of out there and God's just kind of scrambling to do with it what he will. But the Bible never teaches this view of God. The Bible, in fact, teaches just the opposite, that evil does ultimately have a purpose. And I'm going to explain that. But first, check out this clip from James White. I think he handles this very succinctly in about two minutes here. At this point, what, what our Christian brother should have been saying immediately was to make turn the language that's being used around 
and say, God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass so that anything that takes place in time actually has meaning. Otherwise, you have completely meaningless activity taking place. You have, you have sin, you have rape, you have abuse, you have wars, all these things, and they have no meaning. God is working all things after the counsel of his will. And the, in the final analysis, and this is beyond our capacity as finite human beings right now to be able to see, in the final analysis, we're going to see how all of this worked together for our good and for his glory. We can't see that right now, but we affirm there is no such thing as meaningless evil over against others who do affirm that God is constantly disappointed, that God is constantly upset, that God is constantly sad, that God is constantly frustrated, that God is constantly trying to do things he cannot accomplish in this world. Now, those are the people that are, you know, open theists or people like that. But then you've got the provisionists who say, God knew all this was going to happen. And he knew all this evil. He still brought it into existence for no purpose at all. There's, there, there's, no, there's no redemptive purpose. There's, you know, after the fact, God can try to bring something good out of it. But he knew that from the beginning. And the primary mover in all of this is always man. Never God. So even if he brings good out of it, it's only limited to what man will allow him to do anyways. Man, 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 man. It's all the way through it. In the, in the, in the. So it's all about humanity. That sounds a lot like Satan. You will not die. You will be like God. See, this is the problem. It's humanity trying to usurp the position of God. And there are certain things that God has not told us. And people say, well, you're saying God has a secret will? Yes, we do not know all the things God is doing. Anyone that thinks that is foolish. And so God has a will that has been plainly known through the Bible. And then God has a will with, which he's doing things which we don't fully yet know and will perhaps never know. Perhaps in eternity we will know. But the problem of theodicy is a category mistake by my estimation. People want to know uh, where it came from, and we don't have the ability to understand that. And the ways that people answer it are superficial and not well thought through. We do know why it exists, and we can tell that 100%. Well, this is basically a chess game where uh, people on the other side, like the person speaking, who will remain nameless, uh, just thinks he's so clever, and he, he wants to push it and say, well, God uh, decrees that these evil things happen. Well, we don't know uh, exactly why, but we do know that good will come from it. And so if you don't hold to a sovereign view of God, you have meaningless evil. You have God permitting pointless evil for no purpose, which would not be good. And we know God is always good. So thus you have people on the other side of this camp accusing God of evil. That is blasphemous. And it actually really is because of their ego. It's either they're not regenerate they can't see it. They don't want to see it. And ultimately, I think the main issue with this problem of theodicy is a lack of submission. It's a lack of love for who God actually is in truth. And it's a form of idolatry where they cannot submit to mystery. They cannot submit to paradox. They cannot submit to the fallibility of human reason. There's only so far this can take you. It's not, your brain is not as big as you think it is. And God is much more intelligent, sovereign, and good than you understand. And so to put that back and say, well, then that would make God evil. Well, to the provisionalists, Arminian, Pelagian, semi-Pelagian, people of varying degrees of unconversion there uh, that are not converted, perhaps. Well, those camps, some of them are not converted. Um, then what is the purpose of God when he says, I will use all things for good, all things work for good? And what you have here is if this position of God being sovereign and decreeing that evil exists, which is the biblical position, but he does it sinlessly, is true. And you say that is makes God the author of evil. You've just blasphemed God. You have just 100% blasphemed the true and living triune God of the Bible. Not a good look, not a good place to be. And this is a foolish position by many, many criteria. It is an absolutely foolish position because you're accusing God 
that made you, that saved you supposedly of being the author of evil. You say, well, I don't believe that that's who he really is. doesn't matter. You're doing it. You're accusing him of being evil. That is a blasphemous position. So here's R.C. Sproul in about four minutes explaining uh, more, I guess, more in depth this position. So this is a bit of a long answer, but pay close attention because he really does explain. We can know why evil exists. We don't know where it came from. And that is as far as you can push this rock. I'm about to say now, it might shock you and could easily be misunderstood by you. Before I say it, I want to also say that the Bible makes it clear that it is a sin to call good evil. And it is a sin to call evil good. And that's a sin that we commit every day when we try to justify our own disobedience and our own moral sinfulness. We try to turn it around and make our evil actually look good. Or when we despise the law of God and hate the law of God, which is good, we say there's something wrong with that law. I'm not going to obey it because it's not good for me. I'm calling good evil. So we're not allowed to call good evil or evil good. That's axiomatic. Now here's what I'm going to say. Evil is not good. But it is good that there is evil. Evil is not good, but it is good that there is evil. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in a universe ruled by a perfect God. God has His purpose for the entrance of evil into this world. And in a certain sense, as Augustine said centuries ago, God even ordained that evil come into the world. If He did not ordain it, it wouldn't be here, because evil has no power to overcome the sovereign providential government of this universe. Now the, the favorite verse that is annually voted by evangelical Christians as people's favorite verse in the Bible is Romans 8.28. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and who are called according to His purpose. Now, unless God has sovereign power over evil, He will not be able to keep that promise. That promise that we cling to, that promise we rely on, that promise that encourages us that no matter how many bad things we suffer in this world. It's not that God is saying that those bad things are good things, but He's saying that they are working for good. I'm using it ultimately for good. Unless God has the power over good and evil, He can't make that promise. Do you see that? And so for purposes I don't know and I don't understand, God, as Augustine qualified in a certain sense, ordained that evil come into this world. Not naively so that you may experience the difference between good and evil. My daddy used to say, you don't have to live in a garbage can to know that it stinks. But for a redemptive purpose, the classic example of that is the story of Joseph. What you meant for evil, God meant it for good. So here's the problem, okay? The problem of evil, Satan did not coerce Adam and Eve in, in the ultimate sense because then they would have an excuse, okay? Man's autonomy is not an excuse because where did the desire come from? You have an infinite regression problem. The the Where it came from, how God did it, we don't know, but we trust and we submit that he did it 
perfectly. He did it sinlessly. He was not involved in it in any sense where he would be the author of evil or involved in evil. But he does clearly permit and decree that it exists or it wouldn't exist. So in that sense, the presence of evil in that way is good. It's good that evil exists or God would not allow it to exist. And this is where the person that doesn't love God can't say that. They can't go that far. That word, I can't love a God like that. Well, maybe because you don't love God. This is the problem. Why are you raging against who God is? Why are you blaspheming God by saying he's the author of evil? Why do you go that far? It's foolishness. You can say, I disagree. I don't see it that way. But what comes out of it will come out in the comments is so far that you're que you're bringing into question whether you actually are converted. You're bringing it into question because you're accusing God of being evil, which no Christian can ever say. We say, I don't believe that. Well, that's what you're saying, and your position is wrong, and you're accusing God of being evil. From all eternity, God decreed everything that occurs without reference to anything outside himself, so he wasn't looking at you. He wasn't looking into the future. He did this by the perfectly wise and holy counsel of his own will, not your will, freely and unchangeably. God's love is eternal. It's not based on your response. It doesn't depend on you. It was set before you were ever born, and it is completely completely based on God, or it wouldn't be eternal. It goes on forever, by the way, so it can never be lost. That's eternal security right there. Yet God did this in such a way that he is neither the author of sin nor has fellowship with any in their sin. This decree does not violate the will of the creature or take away the free working of contingency or second causes. Second causes means God is not the primary cause in each and every thing. For example, Joseph. This decree does not violate the will of the creature, take away free or contingency secondary causes, okay? On the contrary, these are established by God's decree. In this decree, God's wisdom is displayed in directing all things, and his power and faithfulness are demonstrated in accomplishing his decree. In other words, because God is sovereign over the presence of evil, it has meaning, it has purpose, and you don't have to look far. Joseph is an example where God says you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, but you see it at the cross. It's the ultimate uh, flip of God using evil sinlessly for the good of his people. And in providence, the almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God are so thoroughly demonstrated in his providence that his sovereign plan includes even the first fall and every other sinful action, both of angels and humans. God's providence over sinful actions does not occur by simple permission, but by a form of permission that God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other ways arranges and governs. Through a complex arrangement of methods, he channels sinful actions to accomplish his perfect holy purposes. They're unchangeable, yet he does this in such a way that the sinfulness of their acts arises only from the creatures and not from God, which the Arminian Pelagian provisionalists cannot say, and many of them are unconverted because they cannot love God as he is. They cannot recognize this fact. Because God is altogether holy and righteous, he can neither originate nor approve of sin. That's the position. The reason I outline that, people say, well, you're just saying it like it's true. Because it is true, and this is a teaching channel, and I'm not trying to exposit all of the verses that made up that statement. So please, just think about this, guys. These positions have been developed over time. They've been carefully thought through and exegeted from the Bible, and they follow proper hermeneutical principles as well as philosophical principles and principles of uh, basically the Holy Spirit illuminating the text. But I don't have time to explain how each and every one of these points got there, nor do I have the ability to do that in every circumstance. This is preaching and teaching the truth, not so much concerned with uh, the how they came up with this statement, but this statement is a sufficient and very good explanation of the actual position so that when you go and leave a comment below, you can know this is the actual position. And when you won't reveal your position, well, I wonder why. Because you, don't, you haven't thought it through. You're just making it up and you're accusing God of being evil. This saving repentance, which all need that are the elect, is a gospel grace in which those who are made aware by the Holy Spirit of many evils of their sin by faith in Christ humble themselves for it with godly sorrow and hatred of it and self-loathing. They pray for pardon, strength, and grace, and determined by endeavor, by provisions from the Spirit to live before God in a well-pleasing way in everything. So this is a long video, about 20 minutes or so, so far. But the point here is the Odyssey is a complicated question. There is mystery and paradox here. And again, people say, well, God would never command something you can't do. Of course he does all the time. The radical nature of the fall has destroyed our spiritual life. You don't have the power of life. Don't be that arrogant. Don't think that God can't love without your free autonomy. I, and you know, I see that from people like Frank Turek and others. This is not an intellectual position. Love existed within the Trinity before there was ever the opportunity or ability to sin. God cannot sin. He cannot do evil. Love existed purposely, freely, 
it completely in the context of the Trinity before there was ever human autonomy. That that's not the where love was created. So please stop blaspheming God and the Trinity and purporting an awful position that has not been even thought through for a nanosecond. Because what this is about is really ego. It's all about pride. It's people that are unregenerate teaching things. It's people that haven't thought through the issues. It's people trying to make God more up appealing to the unregenerate instead of declaring who God is in power with authority saying, you must repent. You must believe. You know, the secret things belong to God. You don't get the uh, stamp to understand all things that God has or will do or why he permits certain things and how he does certain things. That's not your role. You're an ant. You're a tiny little speck on a dot flying through space made in God's image and stand there with your bony finger pointing it at God saying, you'd be the author of evil. Stop blaspheming God. I, it really is offensive to every Christian. Like the the other people on this channel that get it, you're offending God. You're offending us. You're, you're it, like, it hurts to hear the insanity of this position. And it is a deep issue, but it's not something that you can know how God did it. It's You're trying to ask God uh, the recipe to a question he doesn't answer for us yet. We know why it exists, and that is very clear. And if Romans 8, 28 and through 30 is true, that God uses all things or means all things for the good or uses all things for good for those that love him, then that includes evil. That it's it's not it's not complicated in that sense. What the problem is the heart. The problem is people don't want to submit to it. And what ultimately needs to happen is God needs to regenerate the heart. And you need to pay towards a perfect life, substitutionary, hell-bearing death, and resurrection of the God-man Jesus Christ. It's all about God changing the heart and you responding in faith and repentance because of that work of God. So if you're still watching this, take a moment, leave a comment below, and don't forget to hammer that like button. Like the 95 Theses, there are many positions that people will try to come up with to explain why uh, or excuse me, where evil came from. Don't do that. You don't have the ability and you're just going to push it to something that hasn't been thought through. You can't answer that question. You can't. Why it exists is very obvious and you won't answer that question properly. That is the problem. It's a submission. It's a love for God. It's a trust in God's goodness. It's a belief in God's promises and an ultimate saying, I trust you, God. Can you say that? Hopefully you can. Thank you so much. Leave a comment below. And God bless.